heard some great speakers through the day, but I just want to close this day by bringing us back to what this is all about. It's about people with lives, livelihoods and lifestyles who are unfortunate enough not to experience full health, for whatever reason that may be. So what does everything we've talked about today mean for them? And what does it mean for me as well? Because I myself live with several long-term health conditions and possibly one day for you as well. Because like I think taxes, it's probably one of the only other guarantees in life. Now, I work for the Patients Association as a project assistant, but what I'm going to be talking about today is a lot more of my personal experiences of being a patient and living with long-term health conditions. I'm really privileged. I've seen the NHS at its absolute best and at its worst. I've been privileged enough to experience some fantastic care by amazing people, and I've seen the very best in humanity. And I've been on occasions moved by the excellence of the care that I've received. But I'm also very privileged because when I've experienced bad care, I've been lucky enough to have a voice to do something about it. We've talked a lot about service users today and patients and even customers. I'm a patient user and a customer and all of those other things that we've mentioned today. But I'm also the Chiari malformation in bed six. I'm just another number, my NHS number. I'm a voice. But is there anyone behind that voice? I'm an untapped resource. Am I just a commodity like a tap to be turned on and off at somebody else's convenience? And I'm my doctor's 10 o'clock, just another person to fill up another 10 minute slot in their busy schedule. I'm all of these, and I'm none of these. Because before I was diagnosed with my conditions, there were other things that did define me. I had family, friends, relationships, career aspirations, hobbies, and I was part of a team and able to contribute to that team. And life's a bit like a jigsaw made up of all these different pieces until you get diagnosed with something like a long-term health condition and it takes away each piece. Why is shared decision making, co-production and integrated care important? All these buzzwords we hear about all the time. I think they're important because of the nothing case, that's how the jigsaw falls apart. If I'd had effective shared decision making and integrated care, I don't think my jigsaw would have fallen apart quite so dramatically. So what do they mean for me? Well, firstly, they mean compliance. I've recently, in the last six months, started a new plan with my physiotherapist. It was developed with me, looking at my goals and fitted around my lifestyle. It's the only physiotherapy or treatment plan that I've followed 100%, and I don't think it's a coincidence that that's the only treatment plan that was co-produced with me. It is also about control for me as well. A couple of months ago, I made a phone call to my consultant secretary to ask about a referral, only to be told that it hadn't been made and I'd have to wait for my appointment in nine months' time for the referral to then go through. It took me two hours sitting on my bedroom floor crying to muster up the energy to stand up and actually even start thinking about the rest of my day. You're just completely powerless, and if I had integrated care, I don't think I would have been that powerless. But it's not always like that. Although my conditions are physical, I've suffered a lot of depression as a result of them and used the local Improving Access to Psychological Therapy service, which has a fantastic, um, flexible system that I can access when it suits me and when I'm having a bad patch. So for me, integrated care, there's sort of three tiers of it, really. Firstly, I'd like my care to be integrated from an admin basis. It's a full-time job managing being a patient in the NHS, collecting prescriptions, chasing appointments, um, the full works. That's a full-time job. That's even before you start managing the relapses of temporary paralysis, the headaches, the blurred vision, and all of my physical symptoms. So I'd like my care to be integrated at an admin level. 
I'd also like it to be integrated clinically as well. I know people often get asked, who would you like to have for supper if you can invite anybody from the whole of history? And if I was asked that question, my honest answer would be my consultant, my GP, my specialist nurse, my physio and my counsellor, because to have them all in one room together would be an absolute miracle. <laughs> and to have my consultant understand the other aspects of my care, that I am working really hard at my exercise and I am working really hard at my mental health, would be of enormous benefit to me. Two years ago, before two and a half years ago, before I was diagnosed, um, I had my first appointment with my consultant. And we were looking at some particularly nasty possible diagnoses, luckily none of which I have. I was really upset during the appointment and spent most of it in floods of tears. My conditions are neurological and I suffer with a lot of pins and needles and was prescribed a drug called amitriptyline, which is also an antidepressant. And as I left this appointment in floods of tears, my consultant handed me the prescription for the amitriptyline and said, it might do something for your mood as well. And in the last three years, that's the only nod to my mental health my consultant has given me. And that's been more debilitating than temporary paralysis. My mental health has been more debilitating than temporary paralysis. But it's also integrated care at a holistic level as well. We often talk about the biopsychosocial model of disease. So the biological aspect is my nervous system, and my doctors are experts in that. But it's not just that. It's the psychological and the social impacts of that condition on my life that I want taken account of. And I'm an expert in those, but I'm an expert through experience. And I know my doctor sat in his ivory towers for many years, learning many drugs. But I want his experience, his expertise that's been learned through a formal education system to be valued in the same way as my expertise, which has just been gained through experience. And I think that's key to shared decision making. If everything we can bring to the table is valued equally, that's my exper expertise in the psychological and the social impact, and my doctor's expertise in the physical impact, then I think only then can shared decision making really become a reality. I want to return again to the concept of teams. Last summer, Team GB was dubbed one of the greatest teams on earth. And I think if we do all this shared decision making and integrated care, then together, patients and clinical staff and non-clinical staff could actually rival GB for that title of the greatest team on earth. But we've got to think about who's the captain of that team. Is it just clinical staff or is patients as leaders going to help captain that team as well? And it's a team effort at all levels. We've heard the phrase board towards a couple of times today, and I don't think that should just apply to managers going down to the wards once or twice a month. I think the term board towards should apply to the full scope of influence and involvement that patients have from ward to board and beyond. I also want us to think about who made the games last summer. They were the games makers. And I think they, the value of volunteer contributions, but also they embodied that it was a focus on the experience as well as just the outcomes. It wasn't who got to the end of the 100 meter straight first, it was how we experienced that. And I think that's a really important message for healthcare. I've experienced some good and some bad clinical care. Even when I've experienced good clinical care, I've had a bad experience. And I think that's actually impacted on my clinical outcomes in the end as well. But back to 2013. <laughs> There's a team ethos in the NHS constitution as well. The NHS constitution talks about rights and responsibilities which the public, patients and staff owe to one another to ensure that the NHS operates fairly and effectively. So that's an equal partnership. Nicola's already touched on some of the work that the Patients' Association have done with regard to the NHS constitution. Um, we're also working on a GP checklist, which is a tool for patients to help empower them in the consultations and raise awareness of the NHS constitution at the same time. And we're producing a report on this in the beginning of the summer, so keep an eye out for that one. 
One of the responsibilities that patients have under the NHS constitution is to make a significant contribution to your own health and well-being and take some personal responsibility for it. Well, that's hard enough to do when you're healthy, but how does that apply when you live with chronic illness? And this is where self-management comes into it. Self-management's about taking that responsibility for yourself, and with that comes a sense of control. And there are three main aspects to self-management. The first is looking after the physical condition itself, so taking the right medication, attending the right appointments, and doing the right exercises. The second part of self-management is maintaining normal activities as far as possible, so working if possible, and maintaining um, normal domestic tasks. The final part of self-management is about managing the emotional changes of being diagnosed with a long-term condition. It's one of the most debilitating side effects of any diagnosis and completely crippling, <coughs> irrespective of the paralysis of the condition itself. An effective self-management embodies everything that we've talked about today. There's no self in self-management. I self-manage myself as an expert patient, but I'm facilitated to do so by a team of doctors, nurses, physios, counsellors, and it's only with them supporting me in my self-management that I'm actually be able to do it effectively. It's not a cop-out clause for clinicians to no longer take any involvement in patients' care. The NHS Constitution also talks about giving feedback, both positive and negative. And I think it's important to give the positive feedback as well as the negative. And it comes back to my first slide about having a voice as well. It's all very well having opportunities to give that feedback, but if no one's listening to it and it's not being acted upon, we're not actually any further down the line. And I think this is where the Patients Association motto, listening to patients and speaking up for change, is so powerful. It takes a lot of effort, both physically and emotionally, to tell a story as a patient. And it's really discouraging to see nothing happen as a result of that. Which leads me on to the Francis report. Francis talked about the need for our voices to be heard and suggested some excellent recommendations um, that address all of the key issues around compassion, care and complaints. And the Patients Association welcome these and they complement a lot of our current work. But the Francis report is still inherently paternalistic in its approach to patients. But what if we could see all of the 290 recommendations that Francis has made as an opportunity for co-production? Why not as trusts and NHS organisations and other private companies co-produce our responses to Francis and implement those with patients, the public <coughs> and carers? We could turn one of the weaknesses of the Francis report into possibly one of its biggest strengths. At the moment, the Patients Association have already started working with a couple of trusts on this, using information from our helpline and other expertise we have. And we're wanting to create a lasting legacy for patients from this report, and we're willing to work with any trusts on a co-productive implementation of the Francis report. So all I've really given you in the last 10 minutes is just one angle of my perspective as a patient. I've been very kindly granted a voice by all of you, so thank you. But what happens now? Many of you may be aware that next Wednesday is NHS Change Day. So now you've listened to a patient, can I ask you all to speak up for change and make a pledge around patient care, experience and compassion? I've already made my pledge. It's a team effort. I think patients should be making these changes with staff, and it's only right that we're given the opportunity to make pledges alongside clinical people as well. And it means we can co-produce the services that we want together. <coughs> this is an analogy I'm stealing from Melanie Reed, who writes in the spinal column of the Saturday Times, and is an absolute inspiration, and I tell you all to pick up and read it on Saturday. She's the most astonishing woman. Life with a long-term health condition is a bit like a really bad game of snakes and ladders. My board at the moment feels like it's covered in snakes and it has very, very few ladders. And on those rare occasions when I do manage to make it a couple of rungs up the ladder, 
invariably there's a very large slippery snake waiting at the top to take me right back down to square one. I think if we do implement effectively shared decision making and integrated care, we can actually change what these boards look like for patients. We can take away some of the snakes, put a few more ladders in, and maybe even add a couple more rungs to those ladders. It means that as a patient, I could actually start to make some progress with my life instead of just sitting at square one, and maybe possibly even reach my goals as well. Basic medical care I've received has done an excellent job of keeping me alive, but it's only when I've had integrated care that I've actually been allowed to live and get on with my life. Thank you.